Good morning and welcome to this week's Political Brew. I'm New Center Maine's Don Kerrigan, joined by uh, our veteran analysts, Republican <laughs> Phil Harriman, Democrat <laughs> Ethan Strimling. Thanks for being with us You're this welcome. morning, Good gentlemen. Morning, everyone. Uh, uh, a lot going on, a lot of pieces moving around. In Maine, the somewhat surprising, maybe very surprising uh, word that a newly elected Democratic legislator has been indicted for forgery and for fraudulent signatures on his clean elections uh, forms and paperwork uh, from people who gave checks that are, you have to get to start the clean elections process. Um, Ethan, I'll start with you. The speaker has asked for him to resign. That hasn't happened yet. Um, presumably it would, especially if he's convicted. Uh, what does this say about that process? Well, you know, what it says two things. One, it's good to see the Maine Ethics Commission stepping up, really doing their job as an investigative role and really trying to make sure that these funds are spend, spent the way they're meant to be. Um, and also, you know, kudos to the Speaker of the House. What a level of integrity that she's willing to say to a member of her own party that, hmm, this is a position that you've put your constituents in, you need to step down. How different is that, of course, from the federal level where McCarthy, of course, won't even call on a member of Congress to step down who uh, has clearly lied to his constituents, is now under multiple investigations in George Santos. So um, kudos to Speaker Talbot Ross and kudos to Maine Ethics. Uh, I hope he does step down. Yeah, Phil? Well, in a, in a rare moment of bipartisanship, <laughs> I couldn't agree more with what Ethan has said. You won't put your arm around. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm going to get, take it a step further. I think this goes right down to the, the uh, town clerk level, who probably saw these uh, signatures and said, hmm, I'm not sure these match up with what's on the voter registration card. So yeah. uh, kudos to our, our municipal right. leaders as well. And, and there was a, uh, a Republican candidate for legislature in another part of the state right. who uh, who didn't win, uh, who has also been charged with yeah, a similar, as it should. similar should. actions. Yeah. And, and I guess it shows that, the, that this system uh, over the somewhat controversial clean elections uh, program, that it does work, there is oversight. Sure, yeah, and, and we've seen instances in the past where there's been abuse, people have used those clean election funds for their personal use or hiring a spouse. We've done a pretty good job of cleaning that stuff up. Right, um, petition uh, ruled valid by the Secretary of State F uh, related to the other petition on the <laughs> consumer-owned utility. And this one would require uh, voter approval for the state to uh, borrow over a billion dollars to make it very, 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 very uh, simplified. Uh, Phil, it looks like we'll have two issues going to the legislature and almost certainly going to the voters that could, in some sense, compete with each other. Does that help this situation or confuse it? Oh, uh, it just creates more opportunity for Ethan and I to do political <laughs> analysis, for sure. Yeah. Can, imagine so the political <laughs> <boom> enhancement. <program. laughs> Envision this. The, the voters of Maine say, yes, let's take over and run the public utilities uh, of Maine, yeah. and then turn around and vote no on borrowing a billion dollars to do it. We, we, where do we end up, Ethan? Yeah. <laughs> I know. The, well, look, make no mistake. The, the, the second initiative that you're referring to that's on the ballot is bought and paid for by CMP. It's clearly an effort to just try to stall what uh, many people expect to happen, which is that the people of Maine do want to have a consumer-owned utility because it will lower their costs, keep the profits at home. We'll be able to make sure that we're doing the, the work of renewable energy in a way. But isn't it ironic that CMP is in court right now fighting the corridor saying, oh, you should not listen to the people of Maine who voted against the corridor. We shouldn't go to referendum there, but oh, by the way, you should listen to the people of Maine on whether we should borrow the money. So, so we don't know yet how this, w this will show up on the ballot as essentially one item with vote this or this. No, it's not. It, it, they are separate referendum. They cannot show up on the ballot like that unless the legislature were to enact them both and then put them out as right. competing measures, but that's not, these are both have to go on the ballot as individual questions. Both can pass, right. both can fail. Yeah, so, and imagine the confusing advertising in the fall. Well, we'll uh, be here for people. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Political <laughs> brew enhancement <laughs> referendum, as we yeah. said a moment ago. Um, Legislators and outside groups dealing with energy issues in Maine, uh, two fronts, Republicans uh, saying they want to reform some of the laws, including what's called net energy billing uh, involving uh, electricity, which they say are raising the cost too much. Um, Democrats and environmental groups wanting the state to mandate a purchase of offshore wind power electricity when that actually happens. Um, 
Phil, is, are, are these sensible steps for the legislature to be taking? I think they both are, frankly. The, the cost of energy is hurting Maine citizens literally as we speak this morning because of the uh, dependence on natural gas and, and heating oil. So anything we can do, even if it's just temporary to reduce those costs, uh, I think is good for the Maine economy. And, and the, the offshore wind power, uh, even the environmental groups have said, yeah, we want to proceed, but we need to be sensitive to how that impacts uh, the habitat and the fishermen fishing industry, so right. uh, anything we can do to create more options for energy and lower costs, we should pursue. Yeah, Ethan. Yeah, but let's be careful. The, the Republican initiative is, you know, the Republican, these are contradictory to each other. The Republican initiative is on the net metering, which you bring up, that's trying to take away incentives for us to convert to renewable energy, whereas the other one is sure. trying to say, let's put into bigger incentives to incentivize the industry to develop more wind power so that we can actually have more renewable energy. So these actually do contradict each other. I, I think the coalition that's been put together among the environmental groups, among labor, among Democrats, around the solar, around the wind bill offshore, that one I think has some real legs. I don't think the net metering is going anywhere. Republicans try to do that all the time. I think the big wild card is, will Janet Mills sign it or not? Hopefully she will step up and start working with the groups early so this doesn't get all the way to her desk. And, then she and we have to say that there's, that there's continued opposition to offshore wind power development by main, uh, main commercial fishermen. Uh, new issues being brought up about situation with whales in New Jersey and all of that. So this is going to be a complicated debate going it's not forward. Gonna, it's not going to be resolved anytime soon. Then what a surprise. A lot going on in Washington. And it just continues with this business about documents. I wrote down document dysfunction. Uh, more <laughs> documents uh, several days ago with uh, President Biden. And now it turns out Vice President Pence had documents, classified documents. Uh, Phil, first of all, we've got to wonder, are we ever going to stop hearing about new ones? And do you think, would, the, would this propel the Congress to make a real reform in this whole thing? Well, I, I think I, I learned uh, early Friday morning documents were found in the Habitat for Humanity office when Jimmy Carter <laughs> was president. So it tells me either there's a lot of things labeled as classified that maybe don't need to be, right. or if they are labeled as classified, someone's not doing their job keeping track of them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even. look, I've never seen a classified document in my life, but even I'm checking my sofa at this point to see, <laughs> did something get in my house by accident here? And, you know, hopefully there will be some reform for sure. You know, National Archives has now asked all former presidents, vice presidents to come forward, see if they have any documents. Um, I, I do think it's always important, though, that we create a distinction between what Donald Trump is accused of versus what's been going on with the other, whether it's Mike Pence or whether it's Joe Biden, because he's accused of having the documents and refusing to give them back. Mm -hmm. Both Mike Pence and Joe Biden have said very clearly, we, we want to do everything we can. We want to cooperate. They've right. given the documents well, back voluntarily. Don't you suspect that most Americans out there hearing it put a pox on all your houses? Sure. This is a mess. It's got to get cleaned up. Of course, they do, but that's not what a prosecutor should be doing. And that's what the big, right, there's an independent counsel in both of these cases. That's the issue we have to watch the most carefully. Donald Trump has clearly broken the law because he said, I refuse to give them back, said he didn't have any more and hid them, had to be raided. Whereas Joe Biden said, we want to do everything we can. Come to my house, please review if there's any documents, please. Right. Well, but, there, but, there's, but, a, go ahead, Phil. there's a distinction with a huge difference. Donald Trump's documents were under lock and key and under uh, Secret Service uh, protection. Joe Biden's was in a garage next to his used car that his son had his, access his to. Wait a minute, his documents were not under Secret Service protection lock and key. His documents, they found them on his desk. So let's be clear about that. They found documents all over. But the most important thing is he said to the federal government, I'm not going to give them back to you. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'd already given back. And then his lawyers wouldn't even sign documents but to say But even he had. so, we've heard from a number of people from both sides of the aisle suggesting that because of all of this, it makes prosecution of former President Trump yeah, on this I agree unlikely. That. Yeah. Well, I, and that's the problem, right? If somebody breaks the law and saying, I, I've violated this law and I'm not even going to cooperate with government, that should be prosecuted. So if Donald Trump gets away with this because Mike Pence happened to have some documents or Joe Biden happened to have some that they voluntarily gave back, that's a real problem for our justice All system. All right, let's move on to, <laughs> uh, to an even more serious uh, issue, which is more mass shootings mm -hmm. in California. Terrible tragedies going on there. And uh, inevitably, anytime this happens, people say, oh, we've got to do something about guns. Whether those are or not the problem, 
is up for debate. So let's talk about that. Ethan, we'll start with you. Uh, does this do anything to change the constant debate about guns? Well, sadly, it probably won't, but it should. And it should both at the federal level and at the state level. You know, one of the things that we see over and over and over again with these shootings, that these guns were obtained legally, right? That it's so easy to get guns like this. And even if your state has strong laws, if there aren't strong laws in the state next to you. So it's so important for the federal government to do something. But the state legislature should as well, because we have to remember- What? May what? What's wrong well, with uh, Maine's uh, laws? Well, let me get there, right? In Maine right now, what we need to understand is that in the Northeast, I'm not talking about New England, in the Northeast, we have the second highest ratio of gun deaths of any state. That includes New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. Over 10 people per 100,000 in Maine get killed by guns every year. It's less than half that in those other states, which have stronger gun control laws. And those stronger gun control laws, universal background checks, bans on assault weapons, waiting periods, limitations on magazine size, making sure that you don't just allow people to have uh, um, open carry walking around everywhere. Mm. Make guns less accessible and you reduce gun violence. Yet in Maine where we appear to have, obviously there are crimes that happen and domestic crimes especially where guns are involved, but it's, uh, we're not having mass shootings, thank God. Phil, uh, do you see that this changes anything in Maine? Well, I, I hope it changes something in America. And to me, the, the discussion that we're not focusing on is the behavior, the motivation behind the people who've got their finger on the trigger. Mm -hmm. That's the most important piece in this discussion, in my view, and we're not even talking about it. Why are these people compelled to behave in this way? Mm -hmm. That's, uh, but that, if you have someone who's angry at a workplace, or as in the case of, uh, of the, uh, the elderly uh, Asian gentleman, we don't know why he, why, right, what ticked him a, off. A, a uh, generation or two ago, if someone was mad in the workplace, that's not what they did to uh, respond. What, right, but what, we didn't have as many guns back then. The guns weren't as accessible. We banned assault weapons for 10 years. And before that, you, you, know, you know the one weapon that's never used in a mass shooting in America? A machine gun. You know why? Because they're banned because you cannot have one without a permit unless you know how to use it and unless it was built in 1812 or something, right? I mean, that's a serious but, but difference. It, as far as Maine goes, uh, we, you know, the laws we have are the laws we have. We have open carry. We have um, open carry. We do not have universal background checks. We have no waiting periods. I, I mean, literally, we have some of the weakest gun laws in all of the Northeast, and that's why we have some of the highest gun deaths per so 100,000 people. So background checks don't work? Background checks do work. We don't have them. We That's do. The you have to have background checks to purchase a gun. No, you do not in the state of Maine. Only if you buy it from a licensed dealer. Right. You can go. I, you can sell me a gun right mm -hmm. now without doing any background check. Mm -hmm. You should do a background check if you sell me a gun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, yes, you should. <laughs> You're not going to get it. Then. <laughs> oh, what, briefly, uh, this business in Congress with Representative Santos continues. Uh, Phil, what do you see as the the final outcome of that. Well, I think the next step is that a House ethics investigation should be open and hearings held, and um, presumably they will come to a conclusion that he should be relieved of duty. Yeah, you think yeah you agree I, with I that? do think they should have. I, I don't. I don't go so far as saying that Congress should get rid of him. I, I think that's a very, very high bar. Or I am not there yet. He needs to have this hearing. When you want to overturn the will of the voters, you have to have a very, very, very substantial reason. Yeah. I think the people of his district should rise up sign petitions every day outside of his office, get him to resign. Okay, winners and losers of the week. Gentlemen, Ethan, you first. Uh, my, my winner, uh, my loser of the week, unfortunately, I'm gonna go back to you know, Congress right now. And when we saw you know, Rachel Talbot Ross, who stood up and said, a member of my party should step down, that's my winner of the week. And my loser of the week is how that reminds us about Kevin McCarthy, who's unwilling to step up and say, George Santos, you need to step down. It just shows a difference in integrity. So Rachel Talbot Ross, my winner. Kevin McCarthy, my loser. Okay. Phil. Uh, my loser is the National Archivist who can't seem to have the chain of custody under control going back to the 1970s when Jimmy Carter was president. Uh, my winner is the same as Ethan. I think the Speaker of the House of Maine did the right thing by calling on this representative uh, to resign, even though it's a member of her own party. Good for her. All right. Thank you both very much. Thanks. We'll be back with more Political Brew next week, watching everything that happens between now and then. New Center Maine continues after this.